Hi, everyone. Welcome back to this mini course on topological four manifolds. Today, um, we are beginning with our goal for the recorded lectures. Namely, we wanted to prove this theorem that smooth, closed, simple connected, oriented four manifolds with isometric intersection forms are, in fact, homeomorphic. We um, saw earlier that this proof has two parts. The first part due to wall, that isometric intersection form implies each cobordism. And then there's the second part due to Friedman that each cobordism implies homeomorphism for manifolds of this form. So in this video, I would like to define what each cobordisms are, and then we're going to prove, some, we're, it's gonna be a slight detour from, from this proof of this theorem. We're going to uh, prove a slightly different theorem, which will give us a lot of the tools that are going to be needed for the proof of both of these, both of these parts. So let's get started. Um, first, here is the definition of an h cobordism. We have uh, an n plus one dimensional manifold. It's smooth, compact, and oriented. And its boundary has two components, m0 and m1. Um, this, is, this is oriented. Both of these, m0 and m1, are also smooth, compact, and oriented. And this, this minus sign here means that I'm taking the orientation reverse of m0. So if I stopped here, um, that would mean that W is a cobordism between M0 and M1, and each cobordism is a special type of cobordism. In particular, the requirement is that these inclusion maps on the boundary components are homotopy equivalences. So the slogan is that an H cobordism is a cobordism that up to homotopy looks like a product. And then in the case of simply connected, manifolds of any dimension. It turns out that being an h cobordism can be characterized in terms of these relative homology computations, something to work out if, if you're seeing these for the first time. Uh, and then this may be relevant later. Uh, there's also a notion of a relative h cobordism for manifolds with homeomorphic boundary. So something to think about if you've seen these before. So why do we care about h cobordisms? Well, one reason is that there's a high dimensional h cobordism theorem due to snail. So let's, let's go through what this theorem is saying. We saw in the previous slide, I said that the slogan is that h cobordisms up to homotopy look like products. And then the theorem of snail is saying that in certain situations, they actually are products. And so what are the conditions? Our dimension restriction is n is bigger than or equal to five. So remember, n is the dimension of the boundary here. So the cobordism itself is n plus one dimensional, smooth, compact, oriented, and it's also simply connected. And then Smale's result tells you that this uh, h cobordism is actually a diffeomorphic copy of the product m0 across the closed interval. So this, this is my symbol for diffeomorphism, by the way. And, and we know something slightly better. So in the schematic picture, we see that there's this diffeomorphism phi going from the h cobordism to the product. Um, so I know more. I know that the restriction of phi to this bottom boundary component, m0, is in fact the identity map. Uh, and then now if I look at this phi, if I look at its restriction to the top boundary component, then I see that that is a diffeomorphism from m1 to m0. So in particular, the h cobordism theorem tells you that h cobordant, smooth, compact, oriented, simply connected, uh, n manifolds are diffeomorphic, but right now n is bigger than or equal to five. Okay. One reason you might care about this high dimensional h cobordism theorem is that it gives as a pretty straightforward corollary that smooth homotopy n spheres for n bigger than or equal to six, they are homeomorphic to Sn. And um, Smail received the Fields Medal and this was, this was his main result for which he did so. Uh, so this, this is a very nice exercise. So please, please do figure out how that works. Uh, the idea is that given a homotopy n sphere, you're supposed to remove some parts from it to get uh, an h cobordism to which you can apply the h cobordism theorem. So uh, interesting thing to think about is why do you get a homeomorphism in the output rather than a diffeomorphism, although that is in fact a diffeomorphism. All right. So I would like 
to give you a sketch of the proof of the high dimensional H. Gilbertism theorem. This will be relevant for um, lots of things in the summer school, especially this particular mini course. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, the first thing I want to say is this lemma. If you have a smooth, compact manifold of any dimension, it turns out that there is a smooth handle decomposition of that manifold. So in Andras's lecture one, he talked about constructing smooth manifolds as handle bodies using handles. But it turns out that this is a characterization of smooth manifolds. So in particular, this means that I can start with the empty set and I can iteratively attach uh, handles to the empty set along embeddings of the attaching region, which Andras told us looked like a uh, boundary of dk cross dm minus k. Uh, since my manifold is compact, there's finitely many of these handles and everything right now is in the smooth setting. So these are along smooth embeddings. On the other hand, I do want to remark there are other notions of handle decompositions, in particular in the PL and topological categories. Um, these will be relevant uh, in, in the future. And something that you might think about is, is this wonderful fact that if a four manifold has a topological handle decomposition, it's that characterizes whether or not the four manifold is smoothable. Uh, so it turns out that manifolds of every dimension of all categories have topological handle decompositions, except precisely non-smoothable four manifolds. So something that we'll talk about at some point. All right, so there smooth, smooth manifolds admit handle decompositions. We'll need a particular type of handle decomposition for this proof. This is slightly different. These are relative handle decompositions. So for this, in this case, if you have W, a smooth manifold, and you have a co-dimension zero submanifold of its boundary, for example, a connected component, then there exists a relative handle decomposition, meaning that I can build W, this picture on the left, I can start with that chosen boundary component, boundary minus. In this case, boundary minus is M0. I can take a product of that component with the interval. Uh, and, then, and then handles get attached to the top boundary of that, of that piece. And so it turns out that you can always get uh, the sort of relative handle decomposition for a smooth manifold as well. So exercise proof that this does work. Uh, this is not so bad. You have to sort of think about the proof that absolute handle decompositions work. That comes from Morse theory and Morse functions. And then you have to come up, you have to find the corresponding uh, statements in, in, the, in the relative case. Uh, and then a challenge exercise for you, it turns out that decom handle decompositions like this also exist for non-compact smooth manifolds. Um, there's usually a condition there of locally finite, meaning that um, you can't have too many handles congregating in one spot. You'll necessarily need infinitely many handles, but, um, but there is this um, condition that they can't uh, accumulate at any point. It turns out that you can also get these handle decompositions in the non-compact setting as well. For today, we're focusing on the compact setting. So right now, what I know is that I had my H cobordism, it's some W, and uh, I have a relative smooth handle decomposition for it with finitely many handles, and the handles are attached along this, this very nice portion at the bottom, which is M0 cross the closed interval zero to one. And then the main idea of the proof is I'm going to manipulate this handle decomposition until all the handles cancel. So in particular, if I had the trivial or empty relative handle decomposition, then I would just have the product, uh, the product on this bottom boundary component. And that, that is a product, that's what I'm looking for. Okay, so that's, that's the main idea of the proof. And so we're going to go through and do all this handle manipulation and see, see what it gets us. All right, so. Uh, let's keep going. So what are the tools that we have 
to manipulate handle decompositions. Um, so there's, there's two things that we can do. Uh, one is we can do isotopies of uh, attaching regions of handles. This includes handle slides where you go over handles that have already been attached and, and you can do handle cancellation. So Lisa will talk more about this in, in her talks. Um, so I'm not going to go into the details of this. And so it's a, it's a nice exercise to work out why changing the handle attaching maps by smooth isotopy preserves the diffeomorphism type of, of the result. Um, so something to think about if you're seeing this for the first time. Um, all right, so that is, these are the methods by which we can manipulate handle decompositions. Another tool that's going to be extremely useful to us is something called transversality. So transversality says that if you have smooth submanifolds of a smooth manifold, then they can be isotopes so that they intersect optimally. I mentioned this in, in the overview, so let me give you the details now. So if you have a p-dimensional and a q-dimensional submanifold inside of an m-dimensional manifold, up to isotopy, we can assume that the intersection is optimal, meaning this, that the dimension of the transverse intersection is the sum of the intersect, sum of the dimensions of the submanifolds minus the ambient dimension. The slogan for this is that the co-dimensions of the submanifolds add. So you can, the co-dimension for this guy is m minus p, for this guy it's m minus q. And so the co-dimension of the intersection is the sum of the co-dimensions of the two pieces. Um, you can work out that the result is this p plus q minus m. So in particular, if, if the sum p plus q is uh, smaller than m, this quantity could be negative. And if it's negative, this means that the intersection is the empty set. So one way to think about this, for example, is if you have a uh, smooth one-dimensional submanifold in a three-manifold, then you have one plus one is two, and then you subtract the ambient dimension three. So one plus one mi minus three is negative. And so generically, one-dimensional submanifolds of a three-manifold do not intersect. And so we're going to use this uh, quite a bit. And then another tool that will be very useful to us is that we can compute the algebraic topology of a handle decomposition quite explicitly in terms of its handles. Um, this is perhaps not so surprising. Handle decompositions are just analogs of CW decompositions in, in the setting of manifolds. So just like for CW complexes, we have uh, cellular chain complexes and cellular homology. Um, for handle decompositions, we have the same thing. All right, so let's, let's get started. Uh, the first step to this is, well, right now I just know that W has all of these handles attached to this, to this very nice bottom piece. Step one is going to tell me that I can attach these handles in increasing order of index, meaning that I can first do all the zero handles, then do all the one handles, then do all the two handles, and so forth. So how do we see this? Well, here's my claim. The claim says that if I have a handle which is attached after another one, but the attaching sphere misses the belt sphere of the first one, then I can reorder these handles. So here's, here's the picture on the bottom left, which uh, explains this. So here's, here's my first handle, H, it looks like a two handle at the moment. And then I have this second handle, H prime. And, and the belt sphere of H is showing up as these two points. And then the attaching sphere of H prime shows up as these two points. And I'm claiming that since this blue attaching sphere misses that black belt sphere, then I can reorder. So what that means is that, well, Away from that belt sphere, I can do this radial isotopy, which pushes the foot of this one handle down onto this, this lower piece. And so once, once I push this foot down onto this, this flat portion, this is telling me that H and H prime don't really interact. So I may as well have, um, so once I've pushed this down, so I may as well have done H prime before H. And so that's what I mean by reordering. So I can always uh, 
if I can just push things away from the belt sphere and down away from a handle, then um, H prime could have been done before H. All right, so that's, that's cool. So I want to make sure that I have this um, disjointness. So where is that disjointness going to come from? Transversality is going to help us with that. So suppose I have a K handle, its belt sphere has the dimension N minus K, where N is the ambient dimension. Uh, then I have an L handle attaching sphere, its dimension is L minus one. And then by the formula on the previous slide, then I can see that the dimension of the transverse intersection is the sum of the dimensions n minus k and l minus one, and then I subtract the ambient dimension n. The result is l minus k minus one, which is strictly less than zero as long as k is bigger than or equal to l. So this is saying that if I have a lower index handle, an l handle attached after a k dimensional handle, k index handle, then I can push things off of the belt sphere by First, I do an isotopy to make sure that the attaching sphere and belt sphere are disjoint. Then I do an isotopy to uh, move the attaching sphere off the, off the handle, and then I can reorder them. And so as a result of this, I can, by, by doing this process iteratively, I can make sure that my handles are attached in increasing order of index. Okay, so that was step one. So after step one, my handle, my H cobordism looks like this. I uh, still have that nice piece, but then the handles above come in a nice systematic order, zero handles, one handles, and so forth. Our next step says that we can assume that there aren't any zero handles. And uh, basically I'm going to cancel them. Uh, Andrash mentions this, mentioned this in his lecture one as well. So he said that in uh, absolute handle decomposition of a connected manifold, you can assume that there is a single zero handle. Um, the proof that I'm going to give in a second is essentially going to tell you why that's true. So remember, um, my M0 and M1 are connected. And because h cobordisms are products of homotopy, this implies that W is also connected. So let's, if we think about how this cobordism is being built, I'm starting with this bottom piece M0 across the closed interval, and then some zero handles will get attached. But remember, zero handles have empty attaching region, so they just get attached in the sense that they uh, show up off to the side somewhere like that. So that's a zero handle that has appeared in my decomposition, and then maybe there's maybe there's some more. There's only finitely many because it's compact. But of course, W is connected. So some, at some point, these different components have to get joined up together. But the only handles that have disconnected attaching regions are one handles, right? If the attaching regions are always thickened spheres, and all spheres are connected other than S0. So since one handles are the only ones that have two disjoint feet, uh, we must at some point have some one handle, which will have one foot in this bottom piece. So one foot over here, and then one foot on one of these zero handles, because otherwise you'd never get a connected result. And so there must be some one handle that looks like this. And then we have to remind ourselves, when do handles cancel? It turns out that handles of consecutive indices cancel. So index k and index k plus one cancel precisely if the belt sphere of hk intersects the attaching sphere of hk plus one precisely once. So in this picture, the attaching sphere of this h1 looks like these two blue dots. And then the belt sphere of the zero handle is the entirety of its boundary. But the intersection is precisely that one spot. Um, and so in particular, these this zero handle and this one handle, they're going to get uh, canceled. They can cancel each other. And then um, you might have these extra zero handles, which maybe they get attached to one another. But then, but then once you cancel this pair, uh, you can cancel this pair and so on. So iteratively, you're going to be able to cancel all of the zero handles against some one handles. Um, 
Of course, it may be true that this zero handle has some one handle that's attached like this with both its feet on there. But once you cancel this pair, that one handle is going to be attached to that bottom thing. All right. Uh, so this, this is telling you that if you have a relative handle decomposition, then you can assume that there are no zero handles whatsoever. But of course, if this, if this, if there was no bottom piece and it was an absolute handle decomposition, then the same argument tells you that you can just assume that there's a single zero handle and everything else kind of cancels onto it. All right. Okay. So that argument tells us that on the left here, um, this is my uh, cobordism as it develops. On in my cobordism, I can now assume that I start with one handles but they're still attached in order one, two, three, and so forth. Okay. Continuing on with our manipulation, our next step is to trade our one handles for three handles. So this will take a little bit of work. So let's, let's see how this will work. Um, so first, some notation. I'm going to look at my cobordism and I'm going to call W2 the union of that bottom piece plus all of the one handles and then all of the two handles. And then the lower boundary of W2 is still M0, and that top boundary I'll call M2. So M2 is, is this little layer right there. Okay. So let's, let's think about what we know about the fundamental groups of, of these pieces. Well, the first thing I know is that I go from W2 to all of W by attaching handles, but the handles all have index three or greater. And so what that means is that this thing is an isomorphism. Um, so please, this will be part of that exercise from a couple of slides ago if you're seeing this for the first time. And then second of all, I know that um, all of W is an h cobordism, which means that these inclusion maps are homotopy equivalences um, on each boundary component. And so that tells you that this long arrow uh, the inclusion-induced map from M0 to, M to W on the pi-1 level, this is also an isomorphism. Uh, but then, you know, because all of these functions here are inclusion-induced, that's telling you that, that this function, that this induced map is also an isomorphism. So the map from M0 to W2 is an isomorphism. So now I want to think about a particular uh, one handle that's attached to this bottom level. So one of one of the one of the elements in this first layer. So let H1 be some one handle that's attached to that nice bottom piece. And I'm going to let alpha denote the core of that one handle. So that's that's in red over here in the middle. And then I claim that there's some beta, some arc with the same endpoints as alpha. And this will be in the top of this little piece. So somewhere in that highlighted portion is some beta, such that the union of alpha and beta is null homotopic in W2. So I'll write a few more details about this in the type lecture notes. But the way to just the way to think about this is that uh, if this were not true, then W2 would have more pi one than M0, which we know is not true because we just, we just talked about how there's an isomorphism there. So basically, um, we should be able to connect this up, uh, connect the two endpoints of alpha up by some arc so that the result is no homotopic. So it's the boundary of some disk, okay? So this is just coming from this pi one consideration that we just talked through, okay? So continuing on, uh, here's, here's my alpha again. And then there was some beta in M0 cross one, which completes it into a null homotopic loop. And then because of transversality, so you should look into the dimension conditions here, I can make sure to push this entire arc, this entire loop gamma, the union of alpha and beta into M2. But remember M2 is this, is this middle layer uh, after I've attached all the one handles and two handles. The point here is that in order to go into M2, alpha union beta, so gamma, gamma just has to avoid all of the attaching regions of all the one handles and two handles. 
The one handles and two handles, their attaching regions are basically zero or one dimensional. And so there is enough room, there's enough dimension around so that I can assume they're all just right. Um, feel free to work that out naturally. Okay, so right now my curve gamma, my curve gamma lies in this middle level M2, which is some n-dimensional manifold. Some more fundamental group stuff coming your way. Uh, then I have to think about what is the relationship between pi one of M2 and pi one of W2. Well, I should look at this W2 and think about building W2 by, by turning my handle decomposition upside down. So now I should think about, I started with M2 and now I'm adding handles until I get all of W2. Well, when I turn these handles upside down, uh, their dimension flips. So this uh, two handle is now going to be an N plus one minus two dimensional handle. So in particular, what I need to focus on is I need to make sure that this upside down, this doesn't contain any one handles and it doesn't because of dimension restrictions. And so as a result, this map is also an isomorphism on the fundamental group. And what I knew about gamma, I knew that gamma was trivial in this group. That was how I constructed gamma in the first place. And so because of this isomorphism, I know that gamma is also trivial in this fundamental group, pi one of M2. So that tells me that gamma is, uh, extends to a map of a disk. And then moreover, um, because of my dimension conditions, I know that gamma is in fact the boundary of an embedded disk inside of this manifold M2. So remember right now, uh, M2 has dimension N, N is bigger than or equals five, disks are two dimensional. And so as a result by transversality, these things are embedded. Uh, and then here's a nice exercise for you. It turns out that we didn't actually need five for that part of the argument. So if you have an embedded circle in a manifold of dimension four or higher, simply connected smooth ambient space, then even then you can get an embedded disk bounded by that circle. Um, so something to think about in the dimension four case is, is quite nice. And it's, it's, it's a nice exercise to see it. Um, it's, it's very constructive. You can, yeah. All right. So, so far what we have is that for this, for this one handle that's been attached, uh, there's this core curve, and then there's some beta. And what I've done is I've pushed this um, union, which I've called gamma, up into this, uh, into this very nice middle level M2. And we saw that gamma is the boundary of an embedded disk because of transversality. Um, OK, great. In the next step, I'm going to take that embedded disk. So here's, here's gamma. Um, and uh, I can see there's that embedded disk bounded by gamma in, in this ambient space M2. So I'm going to take this, this uh, interior of this embedded disk delta, and I'm going to push that interior upwards, okay? So this, this is meant to happen before any of the three handles get attached. So this is just happening in a little tiny neighborhood of that M2. So in this little neighborhood, I'm just going to push this interior upwards. And you should think of this as sort of like a blister. So the, the, this disc has been moved upward. That looks like this, but, but the inside is still part of the game. So it's, it's, like, it's like a little ball like ha that has been attached on top of M2. So in particular, the top, the top of this is a two handle and then, and then the inside is a three handle, okay? So that's, that's what I've done. I've taken this embedded disc and I've sort of blown it up a little bit, filled it up with, with fluid. And, and I can now see that there's this canceling pair of two and three handle that has appeared in my handle decomposition. So right now the two handle and the three handle cancel each other. That's nice. But my plan, my original plan had been to trade one handles for three handles. So what I have to do now is I have to see that this two handle that I've created, this one that's on the, that's the outside of this little blister, this will also cancel my one handle H1. 
And the reason that this will cancel H1 is because, well, the boundary, the attaching region of this two handle is precisely that curve gamma that goes once over the one handle. And then there's some beta that completes it. In particular, it goes over the one handle precisely once geometrically. And that tells us that the attaching region for, for this two handle intersects the belt sphere of the one handle precisely once. And so just like last time, we see that this intersection is precisely one point geometrically, and that's precisely when I know that I can cancel handles. So the two handle in this new pair, this will cancel my original one handle, uh, but that will leave this three handle behind. So I, whatever one handle I have in my decomposition, I made for myself a two handle that will cancel it, um, but then but the price I had to pay is a three handle appeared in my decomposition, but I already had three handles, so I'm not too worried about that. Okay. So to summarize what we did so far, again, on this left-hand side, I have my h cobordism. Now I know that it's built, we start with this little product on the bottom boundary, and now it starts with two handles, three handles, and so forth. Okay. So that is where we are at the moment. The next step is the most important step. So that's that's the one we really want to focus on. That's going to be quite relevant moving forward. So, um, so okay, the previous steps can be reduced to slogans, but this one we really want to understand what's happening. So I'm going to give a quick sketch today, and then in the next video, or maybe the one after the next video when we start talking about dimension four uh, and Friedman's theorem, we're going to think about the Whitney trick uh, even more carefully. But for now, let's look at the Whitney trick in high dimensions. So to understand where this comes in, we're going to go into the chain complex for homology given by the handle decomposition. Uh, the generators for this are precisely the handles that are being that are in the handle decomposition. And because I started with um, two handles, I'm going to start with the two-dimensional chain group, or in other words, C1 and C0 are, are zero, are trivial. So recall, we, we're working with an h cobordism. So in particular, that means that its homology, this relative homology relative to the bottom boundary is trivial. And so what that means for us is that this chain complex has this very nice form. These, these are all integer free modules. So there's everything splits whenever you want them to. So in particular, this delta 3 is a surjection. And then because this thing splits, I can see that C3 can be written as the sum of the co-kernel of delta 4 and the image of delta 4. Um, so that this, this map that's restricted just to the delta 4 portion, that's an isomorphism. So I'm just focusing in on the stuff that's being mapped uh, over by delta 3 non-trivially. Uh, and then I could sort of uh, travel upwards along this gene complex and see what, okay, this image of delta four, C4 will have a decomposition that looks just like this. So there's going to be a portion that maps isomorphically into the image of delta four. And then there's a portion that's gonna come from delta five and so forth. So if you think about this algebra a little bit more, what that tells us is that up to changing basis, this map delta three is given by a matrix that looks like this. There's an identity matrix portion on top that corresponds to that isomorphism on mapping onto the image of delta two. And then, and then there's zeros at the bottom. And it's coming from the fact, I mean, this is a chain complex. So the things that are in the image of delta four, they're going to map over by the trivial map in C2. <clears throat> and then what that means, because, because this thing is the identity matrix, this is telling us, and, and because the generators of these chain groups are precisely the handles that are being attached, and we know precisely what, the, what these boundary maps are, what this tells us is that on the level of, of handles, every two-dimensional handle, H2, has a corresponding three-dimensional handle, H3, such that the attaching region of H3 meets the belt region of H2, algebraically once. And then uh, I, I should say that, well, we were able to do this because this basis change that we're talking about, uh, this can be realized by handle slides and orientation changes. 
Uh, and this, this comes from the fact that when you're doing a basis change, that's like adding a handle to multiple copies of another handle. And that's precisely what a handle slide does. Again, more on handle slides from, from Lisa's lectures. And the orientation change is just to make sure that this identity matrix actually has ones rather than minus ones. It doesn't actually do very much. And so what this is telling me is that this, this algebra, this algebra can be realized on the level of these handles. So I can precisely get for myself by manipulating the handle decomposition, I can ensure that every handle is algebraically mapped onto precisely once by, by a three-dimensional handle in this case. Okay. Um, but that's, that's on the level of algebra again. So I want to say something more on the level of geometry. And then that's, that's precisely where the Whitney trick comes in. So now we can talk about what the Whitney trick is. So the Whitney trick is the following trick. Uh, we're going to start with uh, complementary dimensional submanifolds inside of a manifold. So in this case, there's P and Q, uh, and they're sitting inside of, at the moment, my middle level M2, which is right there after all the two handles have been attached. And then uh, that is n dimensional. And remember that n is bigger than or equal to five for us. I'm going to assume that they intersect transversely. So you should think about them as the uh, attaching sphere and belt sphere of our handles at the moment. And then I'm going to make this assumption that the complement of the union of them is simply connected. Now, I don't want to go into why this is true, but it is true in our particular situation. It's worth remembering that um, W is simply connected and so is M0. So that's, that's, the, that's the reason why we needed the simply connected hypothesis in the h cobordism theorem. Okay, so we have these, um, they're complementary dimensional. So that means that their intersections are these isolated double points. I'm going to see, I'm looking at a pair of canceling points, meaning that they're plus and minus. And so what I would like to do is I would like to get rid of these intersections somehow. And so that means that whenever I have P and Q intersecting, if I can do this trick, then I can make sure that the geometric intersection number matches up with the algebraic intersection number. So all of these extra pairs that may show up geometrically, um, I can remove them so that the geometry matches the algebra precisely. And then the, uh, right, so what, what is the trick? Um, Actually, so here's, here's what these, here's what a canceling pair of intersections might look like. And then what I will do is I'll start at one of the points of intersection and I'll go to the other one along Q, so one of the sheets, and then I'll return to the other one along the other sheet. So this highlighted portion is some loop inside of M2 at the moment. What I know is that this complement of P and Q is simply connected. And so what that means is that there's some disk in the complement of P and Q that's bounded by this highlighted red circle. And then moreover, because my dimension is five, so it's two plus two is strictly less than five, that tells us that I can in fact find an embedded disk bounded by this curve. So that looks something like this in this picture. So there's some embedded disk bounded by this circle that goes from one point of intersection to the other in two distinct ways. So this highlighted disk right now, that's called the Whitney disk. And then what the Whitney trick does is that it's going to take two copies of that disk, push them off of one another, and then use that to guide an isotopy of one of the sheets of one of these two submanifolds over the other. So in this picture, you can see that that disk shows up in this center here. And so what I've done is I have two copies of the disk, one in front and one in the back. And then these two copies are glued together by this little strip that joins joins their boundary, okay? 
And so what I've done is I've removed this little rectangle of part of Q. That's the rectangle in which these two intersection points were visible. And I've replaced it by this little hat that sits on top of Q. It's sort of like a sort of like a little um, bubble, or it's to me, it always looks like a little tea cozy. And then the, the key point is that these two points of intersection are no longer there. Alternatively, you could think about this as an isotopy. It's an isotopy that's pushing this little bottom rectangle, it's pushing it upward, and it's guided by the Whitney disk that I had highlighted a moment ago. Okay. All right. So the Whitney trick tells us that whenever we see these points of intersection that are algebraically canceling, then um, we can actually geometrically cancel them and we can do an isotopy so that these, these P and Q, they, don't, they no longer intersect. And so by the Whitney trick, what I can do is I can ensure that not only does each H2 have an H3, such that the belt and attaching spheres intersect algebraically once, I can ensure that they intersect geometrically once, so that the intersection is a single point. And once I know that the intersection is a single point, then I know that my two handle and the three handle can actually be canceled. And so I do. And then one thing to think about is why did we not use the Whitney trick in the one handle case as well? Something to ponder. Okay. All right, so so far the Whitney trick tells us we can realize geometrically the algebraic intersections that I can see in the handle chain complex. And now we can iterate. So on the left here is what my h cobordism looked like at the beginning um, or at the, before the Whitney trick. Specifically, I had made sure that I start with two handles and then three handles and then so on in that order. After doing a Whitney trick, I can ensure, I can make all the two handles go away. So I cancel the two handles using some three handles. So now in the next step, the, the two handles are gone, but not all of the three handles are gone. Some three handles are left over, they're still there. But then the dimension was not very important for us. So I can now cancel some of the three, I can cancel all of the three handles using some of the four handles, again, using the fact that my homology is, is trivial. And then I can keep going. I iterate this process until in the end, none of my handles are left. All I have left is this bottom portion. So no handles were used in this construction whatsoever. Uh, and then that was what I wanted. So I, my original h cobordism by a sequence of these handle cancellations, which is precisely giving me a diffeomorphism, um, sends me to this trivial h cobordism which is just the product on this bottom part of the boundary, M0 cross the closed interval. All right, so that is the proof of the high dimensional h cobordism theorem. The techniques that we learned in this proof, they're going to be relevant moving forwards. We're going to see more about the Whitney trick uh, soon. Uh, and then, um, right, so more on that in future videos. See you then.